As I said, this is the home straight. Um, I think we should always have pet coochies after lunch. It's the key, isn't it, to the energizing everyone. So this, this session's, in the past, we've often done where we've read brought back and reflected on um, all the working group discussions, but it's too much, I think it's too much. Um, and we're gonna have a report, and that report with all the note takers will reflect on all the discussions, so that will be covered. This is really about a reflection on some of the key take home messages that our panelists, from our panelists' perspective, but also about because we have a case study format, we may not have covered every critical issue there is in this area. So it's also capturing food for thought, some of those other issues that may have not been captured in the discussions. So we're gonna have, with that in mind, we've got five panelists. So I'm gonna ask them to do two things. One is in, in about, I'll give you seven minutes because I'm feeling generous. And that means you might get less questions, max seven minutes but you have to face the questions like all the speakers as well. Um, so yeah, they're gonna reflect on one or two of the thoughts of what they found critically important about the meeting and then a, a future look of food for thought. Um, and because I've set them that task, I think it's only fair that I set myself that task in a mini kind of window. Um, and what's really struck me, especially in terms of my work at WHO, I think when Effie was saying about, we've got to be careful not to exceptionalize AI. I think when you're at a meeting about AI in research, it's hard not to exceptionalize it to some extent. But we've also seen the relationship between AI, other technologies, but also the last talk of the morning session and the environment. And I think if we don't understand that interconnectivity, we run the risk of really poor governance we run the risk of contradictory uh, and inheriting potentially bad governance. I mean, is that what's happening with the data? Is that we're inheriting governance mechanisms in the AI space from data that maybe aren't 100% fit for purpose? So really for me, thinking about harmonization, and I've deliberately used the word harmonization across our WHO guidance documents. So how to do that? It's also reinforced the important role of our member states, but at the same time, I think we have to acknowledge that member states alone do not have sole responsibility for governance in this space, and that all of us in this room have elements of responsibility. There's some sort of equilibrium we have to strike between hard and soft law, um, and where that sits, I don't know. But also, um, I think there's a clear need to educate policymakers. That came across really strongly. If they don't understand AI or the implications, they're not going to regulate or legislate well. And that's where I think this community does come in. And that fits into a bigger piece of work we're really looking on that came out of COVID. And this is what I call the translation gap that we've got in ethics. How do we get better and more effective at translating ethics into policymaking? Um, with that, I'm going to stop. They're my reflections, and then I'm going to run the list, not in the order in which they've sat, but in the order it's on the program. So, Ross, Upshur, you are first. I'm going to give you seven minutes max, and then we'll go down the list. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> so, my, my tactic of sitting far away obviously didn't have its intended effect, so that I wouldn't be the first one to speak. So, First, uh, let me thank Catherine, Adrian, and, and Lauren for their superb organization and all of the bringing us all together. Um, the GFBR is really true, one of the highlights of the year for me, and it's a great privilege and honor to be up here today. I also want to thank my new teachers at Group Seven. Uh, we had five. We had five wonderful breakout conversations. I learned an awful lot during these. And I just also want to apologize, because I'm one of a Canadian, and Canadians apologize a lot, but we, we weren't able to hold the last GFBR in Toronto. And, and I know you're lamenting the fact that you miss snow and you know, sub-zero weather, that you would much rather be experiencing that than the beautiful blue skies uh, in, in the Cape and uh, the lovely uh, wine that we'd have here. So it's also nice just to be somewhere where we're not talking only about COVID. So some key takeaways for me. So um, 
artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, this whole data-driven approach is a bit amorphous, but of course it's now a ubiquitous part of our lives. So where the research begins and where the sort of typical use of, uh, of data begins is unclear. So part of me was thinking, is this old wine in a new bottle or new wine in an old bottle to sort of have a viniculture metaphor uh, in, in the cave? Um, so we actually probably don't know how much of ourselves uh, is out there in the cloud, how many virtual cells we have in data. And I think really we were talking about, uh, you know, the importance of uh, human subject protection, and we need to protect uh, ourselves from ourselves because we're now entering an era of data greed, to be honest. People have a thirst for data. Uh, data is the new gold. There's a lot of money to be made. And we also have an anxiety and, and a frustration. We want to get to the things that enable us to use data as quickly as possible. So a classic example is an app. We heard talk about the terms and conditions. In the ter and everybody just clicks, yeah, I agree. And you could have given away your children, you could have given away any number of things in the 60 pages of very transparent but densely written language. So uh, we need to uh, get around this ambivalence about consent uh, for the use of health information. And this is not new to AI. It's certainly something that I faced in uh, work with health services research data. And depending on the framing of the question, people will say they either need to be consented, uh, they need to know every possible use, or if you frame the question slightly differently, no, they don't want to have any, you know, just use it. So we need to, I think there's been a lot of discussions around consent. A lot of these issues were uh, uh, raised in genomic database discussions and database research, and they kind of carry over to uh, uh, AI, just like community engagement. So these are kind of perennial themes we've had at virtually every uh, GFBR I've been at, and they sort of popu populate the uh, length of concern, ethical concern here. So um, I think it's going to be very difficult to find ways to regulate uh, uh, AI. And we had interesting discussions about hard versus soft law. And I think the opportunity really is that uh, research ethics boards can play a key role. So there's a large number of uses of artificial intelligence we're all experiencing it right now because we all have GPSs on our phones and every time we access our phone, it's uh, sending data streams somewhere. But for health research, I think is a smaller uh, part of the sort of data uh, um, ecosystem, and this is where I think research ethics boards can play a, an incredibly important role. Uh, and I think we saw some excellent examples, particularly this morning, of how uh, ethics review committees can be prepared uh, to actually think uh, and ask critical questions uh, about AI. And I think that's actually one of the key roles that ethics can play, is asking these uh, critical questions. When a proposal comes, is artificial intelligence the approach that we need? Is it necessary? How is it that it has become a priority in the first place? Whose interests are, are generating this? I mean, it was interesting to see the presentation, I think, yesterday, uh, you know, in Botswana, there's a shortage of dermatologists, so why not use a computer? But when you think of all of the costs, when we heard about the uh, ecological costs of creating an infrastructure to support uh, a, a, a digital approach to dermatology, you might be able to actually afford a few dermatologists or other healthcare providers or train them up. So is it necessary or is it just the new shiny uh, uh, thing. So, you know I'm going to stop you in about 10 seconds. So, 10 seconds? Am I going to finish already? So two quick things that we didn't talk about. Data destruction policies, uh, how eternal are the data, uh, I have a desire, we now produce way more data than we can actually store. So my job is to, in the future is the chief amnestic officer. So you have to sit there and figure out which data to delete and forget. So just like human intelligence, which has you know uh, cognitive decline, artificial intelligence has its own form of, of Alzheimer's disease. And the other thing we didn't hear about today, which is often discussed in artificial intelligence, is the existential risk uh, that could be posed by general uh, um, artificial intelligence, uh, so it's like the big risk that can actually end humanity. But uh, so we'll stop on that cheerful note and uh, <laughs> hand over. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. You can tell I live in Switzerland now, can't you? The clock. We're going to be we're going to be good with time. So I'm not going to take questions yet. We'll hear from everyone. So I'm going to ask Tech Chuan Vu, otherwise known as TC, 
if he would like to go next, please. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it's hard to go after Ross to say something intelligent, but I'll do my best. I uh, just like to echo his um, sentiment that really GFBI is one of the best conferences to go to because it's really a uh, time to talk and hear from people whom you otherwise never meet uh, other than in this particular uh, forum. So I'm, I'm a member of the Bioethics Advisory Committee in Singapore, and we're also developing an ethics guideline for researchers. And it's very hard to scope it because there are many other stakeholders like um, uh, developers and so forth, right? So it's very hard to sort of put a research ethics framework on these other entities. Um, I just want to focus on the idea of AI exceptionalism, which was mentioned by um, Catherine and also by um, Effie. Uh, explicitly during various times of, of this forum. Um, so, exceptionalism is an idea that is often used in bioethics, that is genetic exceptionalism, which is the idea that genetic information may or may not be as different from any, any other sort of medical information or, or personal information. There's also um, research pandemic exceptionalism, which is a paper published by Alice London, uh, which suggests that you know, even if there's a need to accelerate uh, medical products to fight the pandemic, we should have sort of lower our scientific standards. So these are the kind of ideas about exceptionalism, right? Whether or not we ought to stick to the norms or change them in order to, because of the special nature of, of the, the things that we're considering. So I, I was really struck by that, but I think this idea is, is, is implicit in the talks of the last two presenters, uh, Brenda Odero and Gabriel Samuel. So Gabriel suggests that we should look at environmental assessment and reduction impact uh, as part of the research and ethics agenda, right? So this already suggests, and I asked her during the, she's, she's part of my group, and I asked her during uh, our discussion whether or not she is sort of creating a duty to reduce environmental impact as a duty on, on all researchers. So this means that this, this idea is not specific to AI research, but applies to all research. And she said that her idea is actually applied to all citizens, to our role as citizens to reduce uh, the environmental impact. So if this is true, and we, and we accept that, it seems to suggest that you know, the way we look at research ethics shouldn't just be limited to researchers, participants, um, research ethics committees, and then sometimes we think about funders, sponsors, journal editors, but really think about all of us as citizens, right? How we can sort of support the research agenda in ways that we might not uh, necessarily think about. So that's one thing. Um, so is that really something specific to AI? I'm not sure. But let's think about what Brenda said about fair selection of participants. So she said that fairness is to be based, or uh, total selection of participants, is to be based on scientific importance and not convenience. Right? Already this tells us something about fairness. Fairness is sort of determined by the scientific question or hypothesis that researchers want to look at. Right? Um, but it seems to me that sometimes convenient data that's out there in decentralized uh, uh, things like social media, etc. These are potentially data that you can sort of mine and read and be part of your data set to do your research right? and improve outcomes for them. So really this suggests that you know, maybe there's not so much a dichotomy between um, scientific importance and convenience. Maybe these are both important things in AI data-driven research. Um, and then she talked about ensuring, and I think what I was thinking about ensuring uh, inclusivity, diversity of the data. Right? So suppose we just say, you know, I only want to look at the Chinese population. That is my, the scope of my research question. Okay, whatever AI stuff I'm doing. And you say, look, you ought to sort of expand the inclusivity, look at the Malays, look at the Chinese, look at the, the Westerners in the Singapore context, for example. So already you are changing the, the research question. Right? So we can, Think about this as part of the nature of, of increasing the utility and social value of the research. But again, this is not something that, that say, IRBs or research ethics committees typically ask researchers to do, to change the research question in those ways. Right? So really, this suggests to me that we are, in some sense, changing the norms. And maybe AI is not exceptional, but it does provide a springboard for us to think about the way we all think about research ethics norms. Thanks. So I knew TC would stick to time because he's from Singapore. So I like Switzerland. Um, next, we have Kemet Mouli, who's 
from just down the road, and he's the only panelist without glasses. <laughs> we have a bias. We have a bias on the panel. Well, there's already a bias. I'm the only woman on the panel. <laughs> no, you're not part of the panel. <laughs> so, um, I think the, the, the last few days have been uh, exciting and interesting. And we've had so many different contributions from different parts of the world that has been absolutely amazing. Um, uh, one, one of the prominent concepts that came up in many presentations was data bias in various forms. Uh, nobody mentioned the pulse oximeter that we were all familiar with during the pandemic. And we were all busy measuring our oxygen saturation levels at home, which was wonderful, you know, to have a point of care diagnostic available during such a difficult time. But of course, we all know that there were issues around um, how these oximeters were developed in terms of the data and how people with pigmented skins uh, had their oxygen levels underestimated as a result of this using pulse oximeters. And this is a very important application in terms of how data bias impacts on AI. You know, people have described data as the oxygen of AI. And, and I think it's so important, you know, we've had these sort of cyclical discussions about data and AI and AI and data. Uh, they, they, are, they are distinctly different in some respects, but inextricably linked uh, overall. And so you cannot really have a discussion without uh, thinking of both data and AI as they uh, you know, exist in either a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle, depending on the level of bias that may exist in data. But in addition to research-related data, there's also the issue of publication bias. And that also came out in some of the discussions. So when Sky Lego Journal publishes you know, rankings of countries in Africa, what data are they using? According to our research, they are using data from Scopus. And Scopus publishes data from 40 different languages. So when they rank countries in Africa, they are taking into account all the countries in Africa um, and ranking them according to research output, according to Scopus. There may be a level of bias inherent in that as well. But when there's so little data available where Sub-Saharan Africa is concerned, one is often uh, you know, forced to use existing data out there. With language differences across the continent, that brings more challenges in data collection where research is concerned. And we know the golden principle of always getting primary sources of data may not be possible when one is looking at Francophone countries and Lusophone countries where the data exists, but in secondary formats. So these are the various ways in which bias is playing itself out in data and is really important. And as we already discussed, for the research ethics committees, you know, to pay attention to sources of data when, when protocols are, are being reviewed. Now, um, I think globally, we need to think about how our global community has evolved over time. We are now looking at a much more diverse global population in various parts of the world. The distinction that used to exist between the global north and the global south is no longer there. As populations migrate, we know a number of people in this room, originally from Africa, are now working in various parts of the United States and, and Europe. Uh, people have migrated. And we have populations now around the world that are much more diverse than they used to be, which is why data poverty is such a threat and why we need rich data representative of people from all over the world, from different ethnicities, different gender definitions, etc. And so more and more, we need to ensure that data from Africa is represented. Of course, there are challenges where this is concerned. There are asymmetrical power relationships that have been raised. And we need to go back to looking at things like the Research Fairness Initiative that has been widely promoted by CORED and look at how we can ensure that these asymmetrical power balances are addressed. Um, and as a uh, 
concluding thought, I think we also, as, as people who work in the research ethics world, need to understand that perhaps in time our power will be gone. And we need to imagine a world where privacy is not valued, where all our data is out there, whether we like it or not, and that soon we may not really be able to regulate the extent to which that is happening. Uh, if you haven't watched the movie The Circle, please do, because it takes us into a world where privacy has disappeared. And we all know that our phones are listening to us as we speak, that our movements are being tracked by mobility data, our health insurance companies are monitoring us and, and, and sharing our data with other sources. And to a large extent, I think we are losing control over where our data is going. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, I think reimagining our digital future is hard, a hard concept, and the only concept at the moment we have is control, and maybe we need to rethink control and governance. Uh, but that's the next meeting, maybe. Um, next speaker is Amanda Gill from uh, Harvard University. Over to you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, no, so thank you very much. It has been a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, i affiliated to a center at Harvard University, the Berman Klein Center. I have been working a lot with Latin American countries. I'm from Colombia, so it has been a uh, real um, yeah, pleasure being here and sharing this experience. And as, as he said, working with governments, I have seen all these presentations, how these issues have been addressed, the analysis that have been made. And I think there are many interesting things to take from here for the implementation with governments and national authorities. I think, at least from my side, it's very, I'm very passionate about this discussion of regulation. I think that there are some interesting elements there. And I also have to say that my perspective has been more general. I have been working more on the general scope of AI, AI policy, national strategies. Of course, this concentration on the health sector is it's crucial, it's, it's vital for, for the future of, of these general discussions. But from there, I, I would like to say that I, I think under the traffic discussion, I would like to gather more evidence. I think that uh, there is a, we're on a right path of discussing and having this regulatory discussion, but definitely I would like to see more evidence and to experiment a little bit more with regulation and with technologies, even within the health sector, yeah? So I think there are some mechanisms that can be put it in place, like for example, regulatory sandboxes that were discussed, policy prototyping, other uh, uh, tools that the health sector has that can be quite interesting to, to explore before getting into a full hard law discussion. I think and I advocate for that. And as I said, if we get some good experience for this regulatory experimentation, the sandboxes or many other related projects, then perhaps we can have a uh, more clear view of the regulation and where to take it, and that for the health sector, I think it's, it's crucial, um, and that's something also for all of us to, to, to consider. Um, so, for example, if there is a risk to privacy, definitely we would like to measure and see what the real risk for privacy is. It's not only a matter of, because this can be invasive, but actually because we know that that's what is going on, and I think these spaces are worth it to explore a little bit more. I think Singapore, for example, has had a lot of experience with samples, and many other countries have, and I think it's, it's a good idea to, to consider this. At the same time, I think there's a topic that I would like also to, that could be further discussed and in this kind of, of, uh, of events, and it's about funding and the research. So sometimes we will face that big challenge of, okay, this sounds great, or uh, these are very interesting projects, but what about the funding? What about the resources available in order to continue with this kind of efforts? And from there, I think there's a big actor that perhaps we need to explore more in this kind of events, and it's also development banks and multilateral banks. I think they're willing to look into the, this kind of research and to see the effects that it has, it has on the policy making arena, but definitely it's, it's necessary to bring them, and that will require, of course, perhaps thinking of how to bring all these entities that are working right now on this. I, I have to say that in Latin America, we have an accelerated agenda on AI, and I think that's because especially some development banks are playing a key role in, the, in, in this in, 
in this way and, and especially in promoting the use of this technology and the responsible use of this technology. So that's something that, that I think it's also good to consider in a general and, and global basis. And from there, uh, other element that perhaps from a government experience I think it's worth considering is that we are going to, when we are looking into all these proposals, you will see that there will be a lot of, yeah, perhaps of challenges. And I think one of the biggest challenges is to understand bureaucracies, to understand governments, and to understand authorities that are going to implement many of these of, of the, of the things that are being proposed. And studying bureaucracies, even bureaucracy of ethics, is something that is worth considering. And I think that you will really see how interesting it is to see how this governing bodies work, how these ethical committees work at this level of bureaucracy, not as a bad word, but bureaucracy of also as a term of the organization, the coordination levels, and all the individuals that are involved in this process. And that's something that when you put this discussion into that level, it's going to also have a very pragmatic approach. And finally, I would like to say that I'm very interested about the spillovers of all the research on, um, on health ethics and AI. I think this is going to have an effect just as the financial sector and many other sectors have had on general discussions. I'm sure that this is going to have a global effect and at the same time an effect on national strategies and many other national and general policies and, and, and regulations. So, of course, you can think that this can be limited or concentrated into the health sector, but actually I think it's going to have a lot of influence in many other sectors and, may, uh, and the health sector has been a pioneer of many of the things that are now being tested in many other uh, sectors and areas. So this is something that you have to be responsible about and, and also like uh, know that the, the, of the effects of this. And finally, uh, I, I think, and this has been great also to consider, for, for example, uh, some kind of global action. At the same time, I think that uh, we have seen a lot of national cases, national key studies, national efforts, but it will be also very uh, interesting to see and I think it's, it's, it's a step forward to a global action on, on health ethics, AI, and the future of these topics. I think that, uh, for example, thinking on uh, reducing some of the fragmentation, we have a risk of excessive fragmentation on the principles that are being applied. I think there has to be some kind of harmonization I think that it is time for a global uh, action, a global response to many of these questions that we have. I can see many of the key points discussed here being discussed in Latin America, in Asia, and many other countries around the world. And I think that from there, we can look into something that uh, can be uh, of a global reach. So those are my points, and thank you again for this, for having me in this minute. Thanks. Thanks, I think, I think it's great that you use the word experiment. I think we have to be a bit more honest that this is a work in progress and the degree of uncertainty around the way that we govern going forward. And it's the same with, I think, when Pak Yong was earlier saying about community engagement. We have to be honest that we know that the value of that is great, but the mechanisms for how we do it, we just don't know which completely yet are the best mechanisms in different settings and that again is not unique to AI. And the other important development bank and other sectors, I think there's also opportunity costs associated with these technologies. So having health economists working with bioethicists I also think is critically important. So we've got our final speaker, uh, it's uh, Cesar Latour who's at the University of Ghana and at the University of Oxford. He may be a, a migrating individual. Well, thank you very much. Um, after everybody has spoken and everything has been said, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to share sensations, thoughts, feelings, ideas from these past few days. Um, we seem to be facing two moments. One is how can we adapt and adjust the existing tools we have to handle these new challenges that are emerging. So I think artificial intelligence is doing a great job because it is pushing our paradigms our forms of informed consent, 
the role of ethics committees, um, data, all these things to a limit that is stretching our paradigm. And whenever we find ourselves in those circumstances, I think there are two things that we ought to be doing. On the one hand, to find the immediate solutions, we need to keep adjusting the paradigm. On the other hand, we need to also take two steps back and ask ourselves whether this paradigm is actually adequate. Because the paradigm will fall. Um, we just, I mean, Kemantri mentioned, we've built a whole research culture on, you know, privacy of our data, and we can no longer even hold it together. And many other things that we're used to will fall. So what I'm going to try to do in these next few minutes is, since a lot has been said about what to do now, let's try and think 25 years from now. Let's try and imagine. Um, in the first place, and this emerged from a conversation just after lunch with Chantina, and um, she kind of sowed the seed in my head. And the question is, with all these interventions in artificial intelligence, what type of world do we want in 25 years? And who should be benefiting from it? Who are we really doing all this for? In whose interest? And if we answer that question well, then it may guide our activities. That's one. And that question leads me to say that, you know, we're talking about AI exceptionalism. But AI emerges out of a reality of existing structural injustices and biases. And therefore, we talk about data bias, we talk about power imbalances and all that. These are already embedded in the world in which AI emerged. AI alone cannot solve them. Therefore, when we're looking at these issues, we need to, yes, address the immediate uh, questions, but then we also need to take a broader look. And that broader look, in my opinion, involves certain three theoretical questions. The first thing is, um, you know, data, which is at the basis of AI. What is data? We are living data. And we're dropping data all around as we just breathe. Now, data, just like many things that exist, in themselves are neither good nor bad, but they acquire a value from a perspective. And this is where values comes in and normative thinking comes in. Therefore, for a researcher, what is the value of data? For a private company, what value is data? For a government, what value is data? And do our values coincide? And ethics is about check and trying to dovetail those, those different values in a fair way. And that is not, that is a problem that we haven't actually addressed. Why are we interested in data? And what does this data mean to you? And why are, is ownership of data so important? And are your intentions honest? Are they altruistic? Are they fair? These are the ethical questions that we should be asking. Then, how many more minutes do I have? Two. Okay. <laughs> so, data. What is research? Okay. And what is artificial intelligence? So, I'll just not answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> but then, the third, the third poll that I just wanted to stop on is this. You see, one thing that is emerging more and more is our greater interdependence. And, I mean, once we move into the digital realm, borders and barriers that we could actually establish physically no longer have the same meaning. This means that, you know, our ethics, the whole ethical challenge 
is about how to maintain healthy relationality. Now, because in hell, actually, if, if you were alone in this world, if all of us were alone on our planet, would we need ethics? It's all about relationality. It's all about relationships and keeping those relations, relationships healthy. So, the more we are interdependent, the more we need to have an ethics that is grounded on relationality. And our way of doing ethics that starts from autonomy, consent, and all that, are not grounded on relationality. Which means that our basket of ethical tools will need to start thinking more about things like solidarity and really create instruments to be able to apply them. And then, in our greater interdependence of power, we can appeal to other principles like subsidiarity. Anyway, um, I think Catherine is telling me that I've finished. So, this uh, is end here. Fair, fairness, value of yeah, fairness. Fair, fairness. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to stop here. But, you know, we have to be optimists. And just even the opportunity to meet here from different countries, different backgrounds, different approaches, and think together is already a positive sign. And this is one of the great things about the Global Forum. But it has to be, and here I refer to Ross by Celia, it has to be a type of Camusian optimism, where Albert Camus says, you know, the myth of Sisyphus was condemned to carry a rock up to the mountain, and then the rock grows back down, and he carries it down. He says, I imagine Sisyphus happy, and this is why this, this is where we have to be. We have to be tragic optimists, but we should never Thank you. How do you stop a philosopher? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we certainly would give you food for thought to leave on, and I think we have done that. I'm going to do some, like we heard about adaptive governance, I'm going to do adaptive sharing, and I'm going to also uh, be kind to the panellists and not have questions, because we've got three minutes left, and I think once we start, we're not going to stop. So. You can catch them if they're not leaving straight away after a, for a discussion. <laughs>